Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? Exceptionally well. I'm so grateful to be here. Rory and myself, we are so grateful that you've joined us for the Counselling Tutor Podcast. It's episode 235. We've got three topics that we're going to be covering today, and we're going to be starting off with our brand new uh, section called Theory to Practice, where we take uh, the theory that we learn as counsellors and we look at how that applies to our practice. And today, a really interesting one. It's a little bit of uh, theory from the uh, person-centred approach, and it is introject values. Got to say that really slowly. Introjected values. <laughs> Got it right. I usually trip up over that word. We're then going into a practice partner. That's where we recognize that if you uh, are looking at starting a private practice or you're in a private practice, there's much to consider. And today we're kind of following on from last week's episode where we looked at the mindset of starting a business and we're moving on to business planning. What is a business plan and what stuff might you consider placing in your business plan, which will take us neatly into practice matters that's the section where we look at something you may come across within your practice, a presentation or a consideration that we should have. And Rory, you had a, an interview with Dr. Jessica Bockler on Carl Gustav Jung, ego and self exciting stuff. Yeah, it does, Ken. And it opens up quite an interesting discussion on um, ego, how it affects self. And of course, um, that famous collaboration with Sigmund Freud. Indeed. Great episode. So kicking us off, <clears throat> starters for 10, Rory, we're talking theory and practice here, where we're kind of looking at uh, how does theory relate itself into practice? We're talking about introjected values. Yes. And I think I think just the word sounds complicated, doesn't it, Ken? It's what's what's an introjected value? Um, well, before I before I kind of explore what it is, I'll tell you a little bit about the background. It's it's part of a theory by Carl Rogers, and it forms part of the, the theory of person-centered therapy. And any student who's studying person-centered therapy will come across introjected values. And I think that the best way of describing introjected values is a, a story from when I was when I was younger. Um, I was with a group of uh, young parents and their children, and um, they were, ha were having a chat. I think we may have been at the school gate. One of the one of the children pointed at one of the parents and said, uh, "We don't like you because uh, you're on benefits." And um, everybody kind of looked at the child, and then they looked at the parent, and it was it was quite it was quite a stunning thing to hear from a child. But what had happened is the child had heard the parents talk about the fact that this family was, you know, unemployed at the time. And when, when my child was young, there was a lot of people unemployed, including, I have to say, myself at one point, Ken. And the child had taken those values of what, what their parents have thought unemployment was and brought them into themselves. It was an interjected value. And as I say, through the mouths of babes, Ken. And, that's what can happen to us through the arc of our lives. We take values from our caregivers and sometimes values from our, from society and we build them into ourselves. But they're not always our values. They're other people's. In fact, it should really be called injected values because they're values that are injected into us yeah. by our caregivers, by parents and by society. And I think what's crucial about this theory is that Rogers, of course, spent a lot of time counselling children. When he was at the Rochester Children's Home, after he graduated for Columbia University with his PhD and his teaching qualification, he was the director of a, a children's home, Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the Rochester um, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. He would have met many children, many, many children, who had values drilled into them by caregivers which weren't helpful to them as they went through life and were against their values. And we can see it all the time in life. We, you know, I grew up with interjected values about, you know, identity, who, you know, who British, who the British were. And slowly but surely I've modified my views on it because they're not my, the views I had weren't mine. They were my parents. Those are interjected values. And where it becomes difficult is where someone is struggling with the two sets of values there's a dissonance they've got the values that have been drilled into them or they've picked up from 
their their home life and what they're they're seeing, what they're living. So as a consequence of that, it causes a discomfort. And that is why we learn about interjected values. And of course, it links into Roger's idea of the organism itself, the fact that we make our own view of the world, our own view of the world, and it's formed by our own experience. So that is a that's a, a short tour of interjected values, Kim. Mm. So there's the theory. And now we're talking about how is that seen in practice. And I, I recognize interjected values. It, it, it's an interesting topic because <clears throat> it, it hides itself away. So it is unseen to the person who holds the interjected value rather than it being an interjected value to them. It is a truth to them. It is so because it is, it, it, it is what has been told and what has been absorbed maybe from early childhood. It could be from parents. It could be from schooling. It could be cultural of the time that that person grew up. And we, we often see that if you look at uh, may, maybe older people, they may hold different values because of how they grew up and the messaging that they received um, that, that was true and I'm putting that in an in inverted commas mm. for them at the time. And we, we see that that incongruence that Carl Rogers speaks about uh, coming into the in, into our therapy room where a person holds a certain truth, yet it is conflicting against that organismic self, their true self. And maybe it's not, a, well, it will not be an awareness that it is an interjected value. It is not their opinion and a value that they have created through their own experience of inter interacting with the world it's been given to them it's like here you go and we're given so much of that when we're growing up you know when you when, when you're born you, you have a gender and maybe values are interjected of how you may be if you have a certain gender and maybe the the, the color of your room and the toys that you are given um and uh, what what the expectations are uh if uh, across the different genders um our religion may maybe our faith base mm -hmm. is given to us um our culture we look at our culture this is our culture there is an ownership we do this we are like this we may be given messages that another culture is like that and they are like this and we're just given this and we accept it as truth and why do we do that well because it comes from our primary caregivers or it becomes from those that we trust so why wouldn't it be true and maybe there's a time in life where they are questioned um and they can be questioned. And I guess part of therapy is when we find that an interjected value is, is keeping a person from their realization, maybe there is an opportunity to challenge that interjected value. So here we're putting it into practice, but we have to tread carefully. You can't take a sledgehammer and go and smash what somebody holds as true. So we can't say, actually, it's not like that. Uh, let me explain the theory here. This is called an interjected value, and it's not your own. And it's been that is taking a sledgehammer to somebody's <laughs> to somebody's yeah. truth uh, and smashing it in front of them, and that that can be damaging. So we need to step carefully. So mm -hmm. what might we see, Rory, in practice? How might this present itself? We're, we're in practice. A client is in front of us. What kind of stuff might they be saying that would kind of indicate they're operating from an interjected value, which is causing them pain? Well, I, I think the first I think the first thing is that, that at some level they recognize that they are different to their, 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 their beliefs are different to the values that, that surround them. So, um, you know, it could be that somebody comes from a family where everybody goes down to the pub on a Saturday night and has a drink. Um, one, this particular person says, I actually don't like drinking. It makes, my, it makes me feel sick. I get a headache. I prefer not to. I prefer to go and read a book. But I'm under so much pressure for my family to go and have a good time that um, if they don't, um, you know, I feel a bit of a cast out. So there's there's the there's the difficulty right there. But one part of them doesn't want to get involved in having a drink and 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 having a headache in the morning. Wants to do something else. But they're they're tied to their family who do that. And it's that it's that breaking breaking away that part where they're thinking, do you know? I, I should really say something, but I just don't know how to do it. And they might come to a therapist for that. Or it might be that even before they get to that part, they come and they say, you know, I'm not, 
you know, I'm not really happy with my family. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I keep waking up with headaches. You know, we go out, and we party, and we wake up with headaches. And you know, the therapist may say it's something along the lines of it. You know, it seems like you kind of party hard as a family. I, I wonder what would happen if you just, you know, stopped. You know, just took took a couple of days off. And usually, what happens is the, the person will say, "Well, my family may disapprove, and they may just, you know." strong arm me to going out and i think there's where the conversation begins in therapy can it's that okay well you, you know you do have a choice hey i know it's difficult but you know let's wonder if we want to look at that and that's where the exploration is and through my years of practice i've met with many people strangely enough usually family based who who had to be reborn to, to who they are you know they were born initially into the family and then they had to re Re, be, be reborn into who they wanted to be and part of that rebirth is to leave behind the placenta of interjected values i like that Rory. i really do it, <laughs> it reminds me of uh, uh when you might hear somebody say you know I'm, I'm i'm going on a trip to find myself Yes. And part of finding yourself is putting behind what is not yours. And uh, as you were kind of explaining how this might show within the therapy room, one of, what, one of the, the things that came to mind for me is you, you may have a, and I'm just going to use this as an example, a male client who touches on a real sorrowful, sorrowful deep, painful experience mm. that that person may have had within life. And, and tears may come into his eyes and then he might say something like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Goodness me. And start taking the, 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 the tears away. And underlying that may be an interjected value that a real man doesn't cry, you know? Yes. And, and, and of course, that is a, a value that could come from parenting. It could come from uh, uh, the, the, the family dynamics of what that looks like. Uh, it could come culturally, mm. um, you know, and it's, about going, you know, all your emotions are welcome here. And just that wording, all your emotions are welcome here, is a challenge. You know, we speak about in person-centered therapy that uh, challenge, it's sometimes considered by, by students, I guess, before having experienced that person-centered uh, therapy is not challenging. It is challenging. Just in that statement, all your emotions are welcome here, that is a massive challenge. Hold on. Here's someone that does accept that part of me that I've maybe hidden. And I wonder in this client, this fictional client that I'm making up now, how many times in his life he may have bitten his lip and held back emotions because of his thoughts of we don't show emotions like this. You don't show that kind of stuff in public. That is a weakness to show these kind of emotions. And suddenly in an environment where that is accepted what does that challenge introduce into that person do they get to go away and go hold on a minute because of course emotions are part of each and every one of us we all experience those emotions so hiding them back holding them back uh well i guess that doesn't do us the the, the greatest good Rory. no it doesn't and you know we've, we've talked about religion and culture um i, I think we can't I, th I think we can't not um, talk about interjective values without making reference to the LGBTQ plus community, yeah. because there's a lot of people who emerge in their sexuality or their gender, and they have a decision about they're going to have to tell their family. And you know, I've certainly worked with clients who've agonised over that, having to having to say they they're gay, or or um, I know I know colleagues who've worked with clients. Who realised that they were transgender, and how how they were how they were going to convey that to family, and of course, you know why why the society. I mean, I'm glad to say in the last twenty years we've become a more um, accepting society. Um, work still to be done, I think. Work still to be done, but it is very 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 tricky. It's it can, it can be very difficult because it it means renegotiating relationships. It means being being somebody else to the other people, you know, to family or wider people. So uh, you know, I I, I think that it, it, interjected values can be also about who you told you are. Mm. 
know, I, people tell you, I mean, I, you know, in my uh, the sweet age of 64 as I am now, I, I can remember going through a long lot of my life with people saying, well, this is who you are, Rory. And it was only when I came to counselling training and through, through the therapy I had and therapy previous that, as I say, I was born again. It's like, this is who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is who i am and actually that little template you had in me really is your template it's not not mine and i think that's the ongoing journey of therapy to be the organism itself to be who you are and i mm-hmm. think there's no greater i don't think there's anything anything greater for a human being to be who they are to live the person they are and and to live the values they have and not always easy for a lot of people no. And, and you know, <clears throat> we're speaking about theory to practice here, and I think we, we couldn't touch on this topic without recognising that introjected values do not exist solely in our clients. They exist in us too. Oh, you know, gosh. And, and the whole point of an introjected value is it is a truth that we hold that is hidden from ourselves. We don't see it as an introjected mm-hmm. value. And once again, we point to self-development, exploring of self. Um, looking at who we are, recognizing what are the introjected values, what are the messages that we've been given all of our lives that we don't even question, we don't even Mm. question them. Um, Mm. And we take them on as truths and we say, yes, this is who I am. um, You know, you'd hear, hear people saying, I am a child of the 80s. I am a, and you know, it's interesting defining ourselves by the culture of that time and, and, and what was happening at that time. And I guess personal development is about challenging, looking, exploring. And the, this comes with a warning. You know, when, when we found, find truths that we hold that maybe are not truths and we recognize that, that's painful. It, it is painful. And it's, it's certainly stuff that you can take to a, a supervisor and go, you know, I was, I was journaling this week and this came up for me and then I realized that's not me. That's, that's my dad or whatever that may be. Uh, But there may be times when it is recommended that you go into your own personal therapy. If you uncover some truth that kind of smashes your world and you recognize it to be a value fed to you by others, by society, by your schooling, by your parents, by whatever it may be, um, that can be painful. And sometimes it's, it's worth just bobbing into therapy. Uh, There's a great strength in that and, and working through that. Yes, and I think it's I think it's one of those interesting things that you know through the arc of my my training, um, it was a gradual sort of shift. Um, it was involved like being stood in front of a door, and then at, at the end of the process, I was stood on the opposite side of it, and I just gradually walked through. But here's the thing, Ken: once I walked through the door, there was no going back. I couldn't go back to being who I was because I no longer was that person. Yep. I was, I was, as I say, um, reborn in 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 my own image of who I believed I was, and I don't think there's anything anything more incredible than that. You know, to to be able to form yourself and your view of the world by what you see your own phenomenology, your own lived experience, not someone else's lived experience. And uh, as Noel Gallagher famously said. You got to be yourself. You can't be no one else. I mean, we could criticize the English in that, but the sentiment, I think, is is pretty spot on, Ken. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I think it's a yeah. great place to end. You've got to be yourself for us as, as therapists, and of course, in in order to be ourselves, we need to find ourselves. Mm. And it's not that we need to go off on big holidays to search for ourselves. Uh, no. we're, we're, uh, I, th- I think there's a um, there's a there's a song by Cat Stevens where he says, "And I found myself one day when I wasn't even trying." And the 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 the, the story in the song before that is about how he was searching himself and going on all these holidays and all these meditation retreats, and he was right there where he found himself. You know, wherever you are, there is yourself. But we are the, our ourselves are hidden um, by those interjected values. The 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 truths that we hold worth looking at them wow great work i guess uh for for this one theory to practice that's what it's all about yeah absolutely can the answer's in the looking glass so we're now moving on to practice partner where we recognize if you are going into private practice or in private practice that uh, there's so much to consider and maybe maybe uh, elements of that that are not covered in core training so uh, 
as two peers, we get together and we just discuss parts of that journey. And, and today we're discussing business planning. And quite honestly, Rory, I think business planning is, is um, sometimes misunderstood. If you go online, certainly, and look up business planning, you're going to be bombarded with really complex <laughs> documentation and, and formulas of, of uh, business planning. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Rory. Yes, I mean, I think I think just the term business yeah. kind of um, emotes this idea of um, pinstripe suits and cigars uh, for me. And, and, and what we're talking about is, is how to run your operation. And, and what that's going to be and all the things you've got to take on board. You know, when you, when, when you start your own business, your own venture, um, there's certain commitments you've got to adhere to. You're paying tax, insurances, finding, um, finding premises, working out how much you're going to charge um, per, per client. You know where you're going to find your clients. All these are a bit. All, all these come under the broad heading of business plan, don't they, Kim? They do indeed. And I guess one of the first questions I think uh, to look at in business planning, and th this is kind of a uh, more simplified template, I guess, than you might find on online. Um, but it's a good idea to write these ideas down. And the first question is, why private practice? So if you're looking at going into private practice, what are your motivations and what does that look like for you? So it may be you want to go into private practice because you want that to be your sole career, that you're going to completely submerge yourself in it and you want to gain all of your income from that. But it may also be that you want that to be partial income to supplement other interests and other activities that you do. And I think that's a great starting point of, is, is kind of laying out what's this going to look like? What do I actually need it to do for me? And formalizing that in writing, writing it down for yourself. And potentially, if you're going to be needing any loans, uh, putting putting something into the bank, they're going to be asking for a business plan to kind of satisfy them as well, to give a, a idea of what your motivation or your reasonings are for going into private practice. And then once you've made that decision, I then I guess you start thinking about things like where will you practice? What's that going to look like? Are you going to potentially practice from home? And if you are, what might you need to do within your home to facilitate that? Are you perhaps going to practice online, which is, uh, I, I guess, becoming more and more popular now uh, mm. as the technology improves. And in Counseling Tutor, we have, uh, we have training, a certificate in online and telephone counseling uh, training, and thousands and thousands of uh, therapists have taken that to be able to serve clients remotely. Of course, maybe you're considering working um by visiting clients in their own home well what might that look like and what are the considerations that one might go through for that so that definition of okay i'm going to go into private practice but how how is that and it may be blended and maybe i'm going to work from my home and i'm also going to offer online working and then i guess the question comes up if you are going to be working from your own home or from a rented premises which is of course another uh, alternative there. What are the costs of that going to be? What are the costs of setup of that going to be? And what is it that you need? So you need to consider, let's say you're working from your own home or setting up in a, in a business, the comfortable chairs, telephone, maybe a mobile landline, maybe both, internet connection. What is the email address that you're going to have that you're going to use for correspondence? Mm -hmm. Maybe a lockable filing cabinet if you're going to be keeping uh, documentation on the premises. You might need a, a printer to print things out. You might need a clock, tissues, fresh drinking water. Maybe if you're going to be taking payments right there in the room, would you maybe have a card reader? Because I guess cash is becoming less and less uh, um, uh, popular. Well, Popular is a good word. Yeah. <laughs> Popular is a good word. Yeah, it is a good. And, yeah. and and I think it's important to remember that anything that you purchase uh, for your service delivery, anything at all that you kind of outlay and buy for that is tax de deductible. You can offset that 
uh, as the startup costs or the setup costs of of uh, starting your business. Um, but it's a, it is a consideration, Rory, and uh, you you went through this very consideration yourself when you were setting up in private practice. Yeah, I did. Um, you know, I I spent a lot of time in in um, working for agencies, work for school. Um, most of it, I have to say, unpaid because um, I had a paid job as a tutor for a, a, a vast majority of that time. And when I came to set up in private practice, the, there was there was a few things that I had to had to think about. The first was finding a room. Did, did, did I do it in my own home, or did I do it in? in, in did I practice in a in, in a in a set of rooms? And um, you know, I, I balanced the two. The, the The advantage of working from home is you didn't have to pay rent for the space because you know my home's my home. <laughs> but um, the disadvantage, of course, was that you know, where I live, it's overseen and people could see people coming and going. And I didn't think that would be fair on clients. So um, I des- I decided to opt for a room. And then, of course, you have to pay for that room and book the room and you have to go out and f- you have to go and find it. And, uh, you know, as part of that, I mean, it's not perhaps business, but, it, you know, I-, I made sure the room was accessible to wheelchair users and I uh, had a car park and um, had, had, you know, uh disabled toilets or accessible toilets and and then there was you know how do you take the payment and of course you know in the middle of all that is you know i'm i'm going to be taking money as a self-employed person off people which is fine exchanging my skill and knowledge for for money but eventually i'm going to have to pay tax i'm going to have to set my tax Ah. up yes no because the tax person will be once in their cut so there's a lot of things and I just, I basically can, I think started with a list. I just, I think I added to it and it got mightily longer. I seem to remember. I, I know I never thought of that. I'll put that on the list. And, and um, nowadays, of course, it's, it's, it's kind of built in. It's, it's a standard kind of way of working, but there were lots of, there were lots and lots of things that um, we needed to consider. And one of them, of course, maybe even advertising. Who do you advertise with? How do you get your message out there? Websites, social media, um, yeah. all these things form a business. People have to know who you are before they can come to you. Do I go on a directory? Do I go, you know, which route do I go there? It is. It's, and this is all part of the business planning stage rather than the business finding out stage by just going and, and kind of letting the doors open as you go. If you sit down beforehand, these can be considered and, and you can offset risk by considering them. And it and it's the small things that we consider. So you might go and look at a, a, a room hire. You might say, OK, my business model is I'm going to hire a room locally and the room costs X amount. And my counseling hour is going to be 50 minutes uh, and I will arrive five minutes before and I will leave five minutes after so there you go and I'm going to charge this much for it to be able to cover the room but have you taken into consideration your travel time and your travel costs to and from that room so a 50 minute uh, counseling session may well take up two hours of your time in traveling there traveling back Mm -hmm. and putting the fuel costs on that and if you consider all of those little details and pop them on your business plan and put a, a, an estimated uh, cost next to that. It gives you an idea. And the idea, once you've got a business plan, it can kind of indicate how much you should be charging because you need to cover the costs of, yes. of, of, running, of running that business. And then you touched on something, and I think we'll make this the last part of today. Uh, to today's section on this we, we will continue business planning next week where we're going to speak a lot more about it because it's, it's pretty in depth um, so so far we've looked at your motivations why are you looking to go into this we've looked at uh, what your your model of of delivery might look like and you mentioned something Rory you said the uh, that the paying of tax and that links into how are you going to set up your company so um, in, in the United Kingdom, so we can only speak about the United Kingdom, and you'd have to look to your own legislation regarding uh, the setting up of companies in your in your own country to get an, uh, an idea of what is available to you. But they pretty similar throughout the world. They just use different names, mm-hmm. and there are different tax rates. Uh, but there are two main options in the UK 
um, at the moment. And, and the first one is what is called Soul Trader. Now, Soul Trader, you can just start pretty much straight away. Uh, it's always a good idea to get hold of an accountant and, and just say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a sole trader. You can go to any bank in the United Kingdom and say, I want to start uh, a counseling practice and I want to start as a sole trader. And they'll pretty much give you an account that you can open in the <laughs> name uh, that you want to trade without too many questions. And the reason that there's not too many questions with that is because of the, the legal status of a sole trader means it's you. It's you, you are liable. If there's any, any any costs, you are liable for those costs. Any taxation that comes in, you are liable for that taxation at the tax rate. And you'd need to look at what the tax rate is because it fluctuates and changes depending on what your earning is. There's different levels. And if you uh, take on any debt, you are 100% liable for that debt as an individual. And what I mean by that is if you were to default on that debt, they would be uh, claiming that from you. And in worst case scenarios, and of course, we, <laughs> we're we not looking at going to, to, to this level as, as a sole trader in counseling, but in worst case scenarios, there can be repossession of, of, mm. of goods. Uh, to to offset costs of the debts that you hold because you become 100% li liable for them. The reason that banks open the accounts without too many questions is they they are um, that the, the risk is relatively low as long as you have a good credit record. You yourself as an individual, yeah. they may give you an overdraft and they may even offer you a loan, uh, but it's you that is taking that on. It's your own individual debt. And then the other alternative is to set up a limited company. Uh, if you're setting up a limited company, then the company is in itself a, um, it, it is seen in the eyes of the law as a individual in itself. So you are no longer the, uh, the, the individual. It's, so limited is limited by liability. That's what it basically means. So limited by liability, when you start off a, a limited company, um, there is a lot more process. The company is logged at something that is called company's house, where the name of the company is registered and the, the company gets a registration number. Both of these do not apply to sole trader. Um, and any debts that the business uh, takes on belong to the business. Now, you may be a director, you may be a 100% shareholding director, it may just be you within that business, but there is an element of protection um, uh, where the business is liable to the debts. Uh, there are laws that are applicable to running a limited company of how you run the laws, how you can take the money out. The thing is, if you do counseling in a limited company and you get paid for that counseling, that's not your money does not belong to you. It belongs to the company, the limited company that is seen as a separate entity in the eyes of the law. You can take a salary from that company. You can take what is called dividends from the company. Uh, and dividends are basically, uh, uh, once the company has paid its expenses, what is left over would be your profit. And you can take part of that and or, or you can Basically, you can take all of it. It's called dividends, taking it out that way, or you can pay yourself salary. Um, there are more legalities. If you're setting up a limited company, you have to have uh, audited books um, that, that, that are tracked, and those need to be submitted on an annual basis, and they need to be recorded and, and recorded at company's house. If there's any changes in the business, let's say you, uh, me and you, Rory, I start a limited company and I call it a happy day counseling. And then I say, Rory, it's going great. I've got too many clients. Why don't you come and join me in this business? And you come and you join. We would need to go through a process of documenting that. We would need to submit that to company's house uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, to be able to make that happen. So you don't have the freedom in a limited company, but you do have the protection in a limited company. And there's certain tax breaks uh, that one might get uh, if you are running a limited company. And if you're listening to this and going, wow, this is so, so confusing, it's, uh, it is really worth when setting up a business, recognizing that a, a, a business is where you're going to spend a big portion of your life and it's going to hopefully give you some income. It is really well worth speaking to an accountant and being advised on what is the right route for you. If you start off as a sole trader, 
you can at a later stage switch over to a limited mm. company. If you start off as a limited company, it's not so easy. You can't just uh, go from a limited company and go, oh, I'm going to be a sole trader now. You would have to close down that limited company, which in itself is expense and paperwork. But there's just some considerations, Rory. Mm. Yes, and if you're listening to this thinking, oh, gosh, that sounds so much. Don't worry. Why don't you go to our Facebook page? Just type in counseling tutor into Facebook, knock on the door. You'll find, you'll find our, you'll find our Facebook page, knock on the door and you'll find thousands and thousands of like-minded people. Some of which are practicing counselors who have companies who run their own private practices have been doing it for a long time. Knock on the door. We'll let you in, come in, ask the questions and you're going to get a whole heap of Advice. I mean, we obviously say, you know, check with an accountant, but there's lots of people within that group who are successfully running their own private practices and they may be able to give you some guidance and some direction. And there's lots of lots of useful, practical um, guidance and observations that, that come into that Facebook group. So counselling tutor into Facebook, close group, knock on the door, and then you come and ask those questions. And I think, you know, being, you know, People graduate and they may want to be their own person. They may want to run their own business and there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I think that there, there, there is a clients are happy to pay for private therapy. You know, it's, yeah. you know, some people want it, um, you know, free or, you know, without a charge, perhaps is the best way of putting it, but there are those people who will, will pay. So if you're thinking of doing it, come into our Facebook group, take the advice and uh, and listen to our podcast yeah just uh, just kind of to to close this off rory i know when you set up your private practice you set it up as a sole trader mm. but you also were a director in a limited company at the time but you yes. chose to to make it a sole trader because it was something that you were doing uh, dare i say part-time to supplement income it was not your full yes. income you didn't want to go through the the legalities of setting mm. up a limited company, and it served you well. I know you stepped well. out. Of, I, I know you went to a stage where you stepped out of practice, and 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 kind of turning that off was simple. It was pain free, yes. and that was what suited you. But you went into that in 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 an informed way, and I guess that the whole point of this section, uh, your practice partner, is to try and give over some information. We do not mean uh, to overwhelm. Uh, uh, with with uh, all the different options. And uh, I can say that in the background, we are working on putting together a little course uh, mm -hmm. on uh, starting a private practice that we will have available eventually that covers all of these topics. And uh, we have also uh, put our feelers out for this very section to have an accountant to come on and speak about the different options of uh, going as a sole trader or a limited company to kind of color in the lines that we have drawn here. So we will be uh, visiting this more in depth. We'll be going to be looking at uh, business planning in more depth in the next episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast, which will be next week, next episode 236 next week. Uh, but for now, we're going to back out of that pri uh, pr private practice and practice partner. And we're going to be going into practice matters where Rory you had an interview with Dr. Jessica Bockler on one of my favorites, Carl Gustav Jung. Yes, he, he, he's a bit of an enigma in the world of psychology and psychotherapy. And I had the great pleasure to interview Jessica, Dr. Jessica Bockler, on Carl Gustav Jung and, in fact, ego and self. Fascinating a conversation. And, of course, Jessica has done a lecture for us for the counselor csr library and the counselor cpd library on this very thing but when i spoke with her um we went uh, we went on quite an interesting journey and this is what she had to say and we welcome dr jessica bockler who has made a fascinating lecture for both the counselor cpd library and the csr library uh Relating Ego and Self, an exploration of Carl Gustav Jung's memories, dreams and reflections on the collective unconscious and its archetypes. That's that's quite a mouthful, isn't it, Jessica? It is, it is. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> 
Oh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you and oh. to be exploring this with you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. So I guess the first question I want to ask is um, Jung's view of ego and self. What is that? Yes, so I think maybe to understand that, we need to look at the, the sort of three major components of the psyche as proposed by Jung. So Jung um, very much conceptualized the, the psyche as consisting of the, the conscious, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious, which is the piece that he disagreed with Freud about. But so for Jung, there was that sort of juxtaposition the position of the, the personal unconscious, the personal conscious, the piece that we're aware of in daily life. Then there is that bit of um, material contents that have been repressed from consciousness that all that just never have become available to our ordinary consciousness. And the like sense data, for example, that we don't, that we don't need to be consciously aware of. There's a lot coming into the mind all the time through our senses but it's, we don't all become conscious of all of it, right? So, so some of it stays below the threshold of consciousness. And then there's the collective unconscious. And we can tease that apart a little bit further later on. But then to say, basically, we've got in uh, that these constellations that, uh, that happen in the psyche. And one, we could say, is between the ego, which is the center of the conscious personality, and the self, which is the center of the whole personality, incorporating the unconscious and personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. So we can now unpack that further, but I'm sure you'll... Oh, okay. Well, well, I've always been fascinated in the in the collective unconscious. And um, I read um, a piece of the book that said that Jung may point to things like uh, cave paintings. You may find cave paintings in Africa and cave paintings in Australia done by two different people and many eons ago. But they are exactly the same. So he he would have said that that would be that would be part of the collective unconscious. And would that lead into maybe maybe archetypes as as well? Yes. If what happened for Jung was that he, in the study of his of his patients, he, he found that experiences seemed to re repeat themselves, or there were like recurring themes, if you will, and that that somehow couldn't be explained by a person's life history. And you've got to bear in mind as well that Jung was so keen on studying mythology, studying religion, exploring the kind of cultural themes that permeated Europe. And he then postulated that those themes are, oh, these, these primal images, they are universal. That is what he postulated. Whether he was right or wrong is another matter. But he suggested that these images were like informing and formatting the, the human psyche, the human mind. And there, there are people who've criticized that, right? They kind of said maybe it's a bit of a generalization, it's culturally biased, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, Jung's idea of archetypes are is this, this idea, this notion that there are these primal images and they seem to pre-inform how we experience life, how we go through life. And then they're expressed in, in our culture, right? Through, through paintings, through art, um, through folk tales, fairy tales, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so that is quite interesting because I, I, was, I, was, I was trying to understand what archetypes were. And, and you can break them down, can't you? Things like heroes, tragic characters, um, that type of thing. And, and I guess if you see a footballer on a billboard advertising a certain sportswear brand, that would be a, a form of an archetype, wouldn't it? Uh, am I on the right track here, Jessica? Yeah, I would, I would say that um, you kind of take one step back and remove the personal experience and think of a sort of primal um, images that then get filled with the person's life. And so, yes, absolutely, people who are like iconic, um, you know, maybe some politicians in the positive and the negative sense <laughs> both, right? Um, or, yeah, absolutely, people who are in show business or athletes, they can certainly embody certain archetypes, but we all embody them in our lives as well. 
so there were these sort of foundational archetypes that Jung conceived of, and they then um, get multi-layered, they get infused with our personal experiences, and they come out then in, in various ways, right? So somebody might be very much an artist, or somebody might be a bit of a sage, somebody might be a rebel, somebody mm-hmm. else might be a bit of a hero figure, right? And we can kind of see them when, when, we, when we look at them. They might be less apparent to the people themselves. Yeah. Oh, but, that's, that's, that's interesting. So, so how, we, how we live our lives and, and where we find ourselves at may actually link into an archi- archetype. I like the idea of being a sage. Um, I've always fancied myself as a, a bit of a bit of a sage but i'm not i'm not sure if i make the sage grade to be honest with you jessica (laughs) (laughs) oh there's also something here about um working with these archetypes so for jung um he suggested that there are some some core archetypes that animate all of us in our experiences like right the like the the shadow um what is the shadow the shadow is this overarching um archetype that contains or houses all the repressed stuff all the all the things that people in our childhood told us it's not good about us the things that we don't consciously want to own so we we have conscious inclinations things that we express and bring out in ourselves in our personalities to kind of navigate our way through life and then there are things that we repress And they get put into this uh, archetype called the shadow. And just to say there as well, people always think or often think that the shadow is just about negative stuff, but it's not. It's also positive qualities, right? So maybe um, if boys are being told at a young age, oh, you've got to toughen up, don't cry. You know, if you're falling over, you grazed your knee, don't cry, be a soldier. Then the, the soft part of that person is is repressed um, below conscious awareness. And this, you know, boy might grow to be a man who doesn't like to be a softy, you know, doesn't like to be in touch with his or her, with his emotions. Yeah. Yeah, That's just an example. And I guess that plays into practice, don't we? We, we, we come across, I mean, I I, I certainly have in my practice experience and I'm sure I'm I'm guessing it's going to be the same in yours Mm -hmm. where you'll meet people who, who are, if you like, trapped by the the archetype that they believe themselves to be um i mean you made a really good point about you know big boys don't cry um but i'm sure there's i'm sure you could give us examples of other areas where maybe women have been told certain things absolutely 100 percent. if i think of myself for example you know always good to start with your own life experience I'm very, very much learned early on in life that um, I get things through acquiescing. So being a people pleaser and, you know, sort of navigating through life in that way. But as a result, I've repressed more controlling tendencies. And uh, I remember not so long ago, I had a conversation with my husband who said, oh, you're controlling every aspect of the household. (laughs) Everything, you know, you tell me where to put my coat, where to put my shoes, whatever. And... I remember when we had that conversation, a very strong reaction rising up in me going, I'm not controlling. I'm a, you know, I'm a very um, easygoing person. I try to go with the flow. That's a sort of acquiescent bit playing out in conscious awareness. But yes, I've got controlling tendencies for sure that were, you know, but they always come out with our, with our family members, right? Those who are closest to us can yes. see those things really, really well where we personally can't see them so well. So, yeah, whether it's, you know, women, men, we all have got those pieces that are playing out, yeah. And I I guess that, I mean, you know, just hearing that, and certainly from my own life experience, I guess the the best people to tell you about those shadow parts would be the person who's closer to you because you cannot, you probably can't repress them as well uh, with people who are close. Yeah, they play out. It's very true. Um, and it can be really tricky, though, to unpack that with your your nearest and dearest, right? Because they're wrapped up in their own dynamics. Yes. And there are all these kind of projections bouncing back and forth <laughs> between uh, couples. So to become conscious of that, yeah, it takes a little bit of whoo, patience with oneself and patience with the other as well. And to kind of sit and notice what are recurring patterns in relationships? If you're going from one relationship to another, maybe, Um you know, are there patterns that are repeating? Are you yes. constantly criticizing something about the other person that you really need to look at in yourself? 
Yes, I mean, that's one of the things, isn't it, that, you know, I, I guess part of that shadow self is that we see in others things that we don't particularly like in ourselves. Absolutely. Spot on. <laughs> it's, it's exactly that we, you know, and that's the phenomenon of projection, isn't it? It's material that plays out unconsciously. It has power over us. We're not aware of it. And then we are projecting it. We're seeing it out there. Uh, whether it's with uh, other individuals or whether it's even within groups of people, right? Projection onto groups, even even larger groups, stage states, <laughs> and whole communities, right? Can become um, uh, kind of pl not plates, kind of can, can be oh, can become screens is the word I was looking yes. for for our projections. So, and and that takes yeah, it, it takes a moment of pausing and then really looking at oneself and daring to go there, daring to go into oneself to see mm, what I'm, what am I seeing out there? Is that really something that is repressed within me? That is, but has been marginalized within me. Do I need to take more ownership of the stuff inside of me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. And, and that's of course where people come to therapy. They say, you know, this is what, this is what I've been told and I don't understand it. And, slowly through the arc of therapy that's unpacked even if it's humanistic therapy which isn't particularly a, a a a work in the subconscious but certainly you mentioned the edge of awareness which is i think i think where, where certainly person-centered therapy is analysis is something different i wanted to ask you about dreams uh, i think it was friday who said that dreams are the royal road and and where do dreams play out in in um jung's kind of ideas of subconscious it's really interesting because obviously Jung worked extensively with his dreams and with the, the dreams of his patients um and then he went through his own uh, form of what we can really say sort of breakdown um where materials were flooding into his his conscious awareness and giving rise to what's now known as the red book right where he was extensively journaling drawing playing outside in nature I'm bringing this up because um, Jung made a really interesting differentiation between dream analysis, working with dreams, unpacking dreams, and what he called active imagination later on. And that was the, the kind of conscious dreaming process, going into this stuff whilst awake. So when, when we're sleeping, where the conscious mind is not in charge and there is the, the you know, the free flowing um, engagement with the whole of the psyche, with the deeper materials that, are, that are, we're not aware of when, um, when the ego or when we are awake, when we're in our ordinary state of consciousness. So Jung suggested though that, uh, well, he saw active imagination as the more powerful route to engaging with the unconscious contents why? Because when we are working with active imagination, we are awake and the ego has that little bit more of input and, and ability not to control, but to kind of frame the situation and to enter into a sort of dialectical engagement with the unconscious materials, meaning that, you know, the ego can have dialogue, can challenge, can ask questions, can enter into that very conscious active relationship. Um, so, yeah, dreams are a very powerful way of getting in touch with what's going on in, uh, in the personal unconscious, in the collective unconscious. You've got to get a handle on that material. So if you want to engage with dreams and, you know, explore them, the first thing to do is to wake up in the morning, have a, have a diary there or some, you know, just pen and paper and write down what you remember. And the more you do that, the, the better the dream recall gets and then you can sit with that material and go, okay, ooh, what does this mean? And you begin to unpack it, right, through uh, association of ideas, what's, you know, what's bubbling there, amplifying something, diving more into the themes that are presenting themselves. And over time, it gives you a handle on something of what's going on on an unconscious level. Well, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's a, a great takeaway. You know, so the, the message is, if you're interested in what your dreams are telling you, write them down. You'll remember them more often or more, or more accurately, and you'll be able to build themes over time. I'm sure there'll be people rushing out to buy notebooks and pens on that. Um, and add on arts materials, because it'll uh, really help sometimes not to, to write, but to draw or to scribble or to mark make, you know, because 
things be, be, being playful with this process is another big takeaway that I would add on to this. Not being too serious, be playful, dive into this with a light heart. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, start your own red book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So finally, um, Jessica, what do you hope that people will take away from this lecture? When people have finished it, what what's your hopes that they may uh, be, how they could use it or what might they be informed with? I would say um, connecting that to active imagination, discovering the value of a playful, uh, creative engagement with these deeper dimensions of the psyche, that, that those dimensions, they're not um, to be feared. Um, there's much to them. They're, they're beautiful. We discover them and we find out so much more about ourselves and we become, we can become or feel more rounded, more integrated. These, these things then own us less, right? And that is a, a really powerful takeaway for oneself personally. But then when you can bring that into a therapeutic relationship as well, into the therapy room, into a counseling room, maybe there is something here about playful engagement and enabling people to um, dive into some of that themselves through, yeah, the creative engagement. Well, um I, I, I'm, I personally can't wait to watch this lecture and I'm, I'm going to go out and get my sketch pad and pen because my dreams are very lucid and, and nightly on a nightly basis. So I'm going to be scribbling and drawing away. So Dr. Jessica Bottler, her, her lecture relating ego and self and exploration of Carl Gustav Jung's memories dreams and reflections on the collective unconscious of these archetypes will be available very soon in both the counselling study resource and the counsellor CPD library. And it only goes for me to say, Dr. Jessica Buckler, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Dr. Jessica Buckler and to you, Rory, for holding uh, that interview. Always learn something. Uh, and yes, interesting discussion, Rory interesting indeed yes the collective subconscious is uh, is is always always interesting a very different perspective maybe yeah. than uh, the standard psychoanalytical ideas that sometimes get taught yeah i like it i i like it i'm i'm actually drawn to the work of uh young i have to say uh well there it is this has been the counseling tutor podcast it's been episode 235 Yes, and we uh, we had an interesting uh, an interesting little uh, episode today. We started off with theory and practice, where he talks about introjected values, the work of Rogers, and how they present and how they are work with in real life situations. In practice, partner Ken and myself mused about being self employed and the things you've got to think about when starting your own business, it's sometimes called a business plan. And in practice matters, I met up with Dr. Jessica Buckler and we looked at the work and in fact, part of the work of Carl Gustav Jung, which was ego and self. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe.